Heather Flannery. I'm pleased to be your moderator. I hope that this is a, an evocative discussion that leads to productive uh, new ideas about, about how to address uh, gender disparity in the technology sector and in, in this particular one. Um, so I would like to have our panelists uh, give an introduction to themselves just briefly. Let's do like the, the 15 second version and then we're going to go around it. I think we agreed we're going to spend a few minutes talking about what each of us is doing professionally in the blockchain and healthcare space and give the audience a foundation in our activities. Okay. Start here. So hi, I'm Karen and um, spoke earlier on um, what we're doing with Patientory in terms of um, integration of payments. We also, in general, uh, provide web services to connect to any blockchain, um, any of the major blockchains. And, uh, and our CEO is also a female, so I um, thought that'd be something interesting to talk about. <laughs> yeah. um, my name is Marquesa Finch. Um, I am a public health <coughs> professional by training, uh, but I've been in the digital health space and in the, um, the venture space for a number of years now, probably more than my public health years. At this point, um, I am the founding partner of P2 Health Ventures. We're a fund that invests in um, public health tech, which is something that we coined, and that includes preventative care, uh, preventative solutions, population health, social determinants. Um, so really, the tools that are and will be used in supporting value-based care, so much of what Jason just talked about. Uh, the solutions that are create, being created right now um, for that system is, is the vertical that we invest in. I'm also the blockchain health lead for the Silicon Valley Blockchain Society, um, which is an ecosystem and consortium of blockchain investors with about, at this point, I think we have a trillion and a half of assets under management um, for blockchain investment. Um, so please, please, please send blockchain health deals my way. I really need some good deal flow. And I, I will probably need a mic because I'm, my voice doesn't carry, but I'm Marilyn Jackson, and I'm the president of Undergrad Networks. We're a software and networking integration firm, and we are uh, currently building a couple of blockchain platforms as well as retooling and reskilling the workforce in support of blockchain, artificial intelligence, as well as IoT. Good afternoon, I'm Rika Sukenik. I work for a blockchain startup, thank you, uh, called Consensus. Um, we, we develop products on Ethereum. Uh, before that, I was working for Deloitte in the blockchain space. Um, so I've got some enterprise uh, knowledge. Also, um, I know uh, quite a, a bit on the public uh, of blockchains. Base. Um, so I'm super excited to be here and I'm excited um, to get this uh, panel started. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just really briefly about, about me. Um, I work in population health and disease management and have been looking at blockchain use cases for care coordination and clinical integration. I'm involved in standards activities through the IEEE for uh, clinical trials, data management, and internet medical things run a meetup group in Washington, D.C., uh, blockchain and healthcare, and produce a webinar series, uh, blockchain in healthcare. <laughs> so uh, excited to be here. Uh, so, so maybe we could go down the line, and, and since some of the context of this dialogue is, is how, it, how might it become possible for more women to get involved uh, in this field, maybe we could give a little bit of our origin stories just briefly of how did you come to be in this field and to, and to be making such considerable and diverse contributions. Um, let's start this way and work back. Um, would you like to go ahead and go first? How did you originally get in, go down the rabbit hole? <laughs> sure. Um, so I have a pretty interesting story, and I hope that it shows people that blockchain is open to anyone, regardless of your, your background and your technical skills. So I actually studied accounting um, at Georgia Tech, and I got my CPA. I went to work for Deloitte. Deloitte has a giant uh, blockchain arm. Um, and so after some time, they just kept on sending emails and articles about, about blockchain and it just seemed interesting. So I began to, to look into it. And I think as is the case with all of us, at some point you just kind of get so interested and passionate that 
you go down the rabbit hole. Um, and I was in the blockchain practice for about a year. Um, I taught myself to code. Um, I am uh, uh, constantly listening to podcasts and, and reading articles. There is a lot of uh, information out there. Um, I will uh, caveat and say that a lot of the information that is available on the internet is, um, is not accurate. There's a lot of hype, a lot of blockchain can solve it all. Um, and I think it's important to kind of uh, break it apart uh, 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 and take it in steps. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a little bit about my journey. Well, I am a career technologist. I've been in this industry for a very long time. Um, I've worked in the bowels of technology, I've worked behind the scenes, in, in the cut, you name it, and um, actually I left um, Verizon as, a, as an executive and came over and decided to start a company, um, and I set myself up as an IBM partner. Um, at that time we were thinking about, well we were writing a chatbot, so we were going down the artificial intelligence route in terms of building out uh, a conversational chat. Well, what we found out was a lot of the input data that we had was dirty and, un and unstructured, et cetera. So we knew we had to do something about our inputs. And that kind of led us into this whole blockchain um, conversation about four year, three, four years ago. Because what happens with blockchain, it becomes a buffet of data for AI in terms of, of the immutable factor for clean data. So um, I didn't realize it at the time, but I was already a blockchain expert because this is what you have to study if you um, major in computer science in college. Um, and I do have a computer science degree, so a lot of it was just deja vu for me in terms of understanding that um, uh, some of the structures have been organized and put into a, a particular business format. So um, we, I take that forward to say that today we are looking at solving some really great problems around blockchain, uh, utilizing blockchain as part of a larger ecosystem. Um, so I got into blockchain probably like most people around the world, uh, first through cryptocurrency. It was through um, a personal incentive to invest in cryptocurrencies. Um, but as, um, as an investor, you know, I take the Warren Buffett attitude that I don't invest in anything I don't know anything about or have a healthy understanding about. Um, so I started doing a ton of just personal research on the technology that cryptocurrency is built on or that Bitcoin is built on. Um, and that actually led me to realize that there was more potential than cryptocurrencies for blockchain across industries. Um, namely healthcare, which is the industry I focus on, um, and really started to get excited and connect with people that also were having similar thoughts. This was last summer, fall. Um, so still very early on. Um, in my research, there were only a few people that um, you know were really making a name for themselves in blockchain and health. Um, one of them being Hash Health, which is based in Nashville. Um, they're a really good consortium, if, if people don't know about them already, but I think many here already do. Um, and then uh, Patientory was another one that I was connected with early on um, because Krista had been working with blockchain before it became cool. Um, and so she had already had, um, you know, uh, a product and and some uh, uh, you know her her foot in the door um, around blockchain health use cases and applications um, and then I think from there it just sort of took like a, um, a sort of like a, this this there was this huge just uproar of blockchain health companies and projects and and white papers that started coming about um, last fall. Um, I think like Q4 of last year, um, which is when then I started as an investor really considering um, doing some heavy due diligence for our fund and then also for Silicon Valley Blockchain Society. Um, and today it's really grown into its own industry. Um, and so 
blockchain health is really a standalone industry aside from, uh, you know, within the, the blockchain ecosystem. Um, and there, there's just a, a lot of a lot going on and, and um, some really exciting things. Uh, so hi, I'm Karen, and uh, I got started in blockchain because I'd worked for many years with banks and with healthcare companies that spent all their time moving their data around and uh, analyzing that data. And um, as part of moving that data around, when I finally understood how the blockchain worked. I thought, God, it's so stupid. Why do they keep moving data around? Just use the blockchain. Um, and it would solve a lot of problems, um, especially because I was working with Swift. Um, during the 2008 financial meltdown and saw how broken that um, system was and at the same time working with a lot of providers and payers and, and their pains around getting paid as well as dealing with um, data redundancy and interoperability issues. So um, th that's why I, when I first understood the blockchain I could uh, relate and, um, and get why it was so important and with BlockCypher um, our ability to support many different blockchains has made it possible for me to see a lot of different use cases, not just within healthcare, but also within financial services and energy, um, and, and see you know really the breadth um, that the blockchain can be used for. It's interesting. A, a couple of themes that I picked up on from from all four of you in different ways was the this notion of of having had a self-guided process around your foundational ed education in, in going down the rabbit hole and getting getting involved in this in this space. Um, it makes me think about education in general and STEM education, but also leadership and entrepreneurship. Um, I'd love to hear from from the panel some some ideas and some thoughts on on that intersection of education and mentorship and uh, how how it maybe benefited you and how you see perhaps benefit to other other women that are that would like to become more engaged in this space. Um, let's start here this time and and head down the head down the, the road. Yeah, so I have to say I had the good fortune of having a mother who's a programmer and a father who's an engineer. So from the beginning, I had sort of um, wired, if you can call it that, um, just a very logical way of looking at things, although um, I don't think I would have ended up um, in engineering as I did um, and had it not been for sort of their guidance. So um, I think that was really good. Now, I, I have to say, though, um, one area that I think needs more help is uh, when I got into the workplace and um, I started working, it was great when I was single and didn't have a family, but as soon as I had kids, I had executives who I thought were my mentors start asking me questions like, well, who's going to take care of your kids when you travel? And I would turn around and say, well, who takes care of your kids when you travel? <laughs> um, but you know, it was a series of questions like that, like, oh, how many kids do you have? Do you plan to have more? And I would just always ask, like, what does that have to do with anything? So I think um, that's an area where, yes, it's good to be sensitive. Yes, it's good to talk about some of these things. But don't, you know, I, I just would be careful to, um, to not undermine, you know, people because of the decisions they decide to make around family. And I, th I think for me, um, I had the good fortune of being in Silicon Valley. So this is <coughs> probably one of the few times in my life where being a victim of the hype actually paid off. <laughs> um, and that really is, you know, everyone starts talking about something, it just explodes like wildfire. I mean, I think in, in really, um, you know, in closed communities, but especially in the, val in the valley, um, it, it's a place of high adoption rates um, and, and high buzz rates. And so it's, it, it can be a blessing and a curse at the same time. Um, if it really is legitimate of what that and blockchain is, then um, you know you start to do a lot of self education, but there are other people doing the same thing at different at varying levels who also have wide networks and you can learn from those folks and their existing networks. And so that is that's how I, I learned uh, essentially. Um, and then started to share my own ideas. So within my research, um, you know, realized that other people could benefit from the dots I was connecting. Started sharing that online, um, and before I know it, I was being invited to panels. Um, and uh, had a little bit of, um, uh, what's, what's the term, uh, uh, imposter syndrome in the beginning, uh, because I didn't really think that I was a blockchain expert until someone pointed out who, who's, who is a blockchain expert for an industry that's been around literally five years or less. 
So, you know, I think anyone that tries to make anyone else feel like they know more than than said person, um, I think really needs to take a hard look at, at themselves because everyone, we're, this is an industry where anyone that wants to get in can get in because it's so early. Um, you can learn really fast and you can be a contributing part of that ecosystem very quickly. Um, so that's something I always like to just re-communicate over and over and over again. I think there is a lot of hesitation and um, a lot of untapped talent because we start to put these imposter syndrome barriers in front of us. Um, and when it comes to blockchain, if you've been in it for six months, you're an expert. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I guess my take is, is, is going to be a little bit different because I'm coming more from the technical um, realm of blockchain. And I think that there has to be um, um, more exposure because this is, as with any technology, especially when it's in its infancy, it's all about being exposed to it more than anything. Um, it, it, it has a, a reminiscent of early web years when we started with email and connected, connected systems, et cetera. It still, it has the same kind of vibe. So in terms of being able to be a, a full participant, I really think that uh, the definition has to be a lot clearer and a lot more granular than it is today because blockchain is like saying you're in IT. It doesn't necessarily have a definition. And so when you start looking at the deeper definitions of what it means to be a participant in the blockchain community, you're gonna find that there are many, and there are many ways for you to play. And so because of that, um, I, when I'm mentoring and, and talking to some of the younger people that are, are just getting into this industry, I, the first question I ask them is, what do you want to do inside of blockchain? Because there are a lot of things that you could do. Everything from entrepreneur to being that DevOps engineer. There, there are many, many places where you can play. And depending on, your out, on what it is that you want to do, there's a certain path that you have to take. So I think that we need to step back and ask those questions in terms of, you know, yes, you may have a STEM education, but does that necessarily mean you want to end up in the blockchain space when there are like 15 other areas in which you can pursue opportunity? Or, or is there something special about what you're doing from a SME perspective? You might be a creative on the music side and get into digital rights, and, and that has a blockchain application. So it really does depend on what it is that you want to do at the end of the day. Yeah, I would just echo everyone's comments so far. Um, there is opportunity, it's uh, abundant. There's, there are roles that aren't just technical. So as all these startups are growing, there's op uh, opportunities in, 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 in marketing, in operations, in HR. Uh, with that said, I think it's also important that all of those people actually understand blockchain and what it is, and that they s s s serve as the as the educators for everyone else, uh, because it is so Im important that at this point in time, uh, we as the people who are on the uh, the uh, the inside are educating and telling others who aren't as uh, familiar about it because in order uh, for blockchain to succeed, we have to have network effects. There have to be a lot of people participating on these, these, these blockchains, whether it's as um, part participants who actually are, are, are using the service or on the inside. And what I'm interested in is all of these cool incentive mechanisms that blockchains in, in, enable. Um, I can uh, talk about that some more later, but I think, um, I think that answers the question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's, it's wonderful to see uh, that many men chose to attend this uh, panel. So thanks, uh, gentlemen, for, for being part of the conversation. Uh, I think this particular topic tends to be really evocative. It is sometimes anxiety provoking. It is sometimes very challenging to discuss, I think, for both, for both men and women for different reasons. Uh, none of us have a, a unilateral set of opinions uh, none of us can speak for the aggregate uh, of our gender or any demographic. Uh, I think it, we, we have limited time left on this panel, 
and maybe we could focus um, the next couple of minutes on, on trying to highlight. So, so Karen, you surfaced the issue of the change that you perceived in how you were um, interacted with when you became a mother. Motherhood's a very female thing, and it seems to be different than fatherhood professionally. It just, you know, maybe maybe many of us could agree on that. Uh, that's one that's one issue of, of this constellation of, of possible challenges. Um, maybe we could each speak to uh, an area that is particularly challenging to talk about and see if we can surface some dialogue that, that helps everyone participating in this conversation feel like they came away with some kind of plan or action or way to contribute, or way to help. Um, how does that sound? Yeah. All right, and, and since I've, I've picked on you because of the, your, your earlier remarks about having become a mother and what that was like, maybe you could start and then let's, let's go down that line. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So um, one thing um, that I have really appreciated is um, when, in, you know, in many meetings, um, and we all um, realize this, we're the only woman talking to a room full of men or in a meeting full of men. And um, what's very helpful is when there are some communication issues, um, for whatever reason, that um, one person or a couple people realize that there are those communication issues and then either in the meeting help that person out or kind of play as that person to is, uh, play the role of of um, either moderating um, or uh, standing up for you know the person who's trying to make a point right um, and, and and sort of smoothing out the, so the communication issues that may be in that meeting and I think that's really important because uh, a lot of times the um, the challenges maybe that we have culturally um, kind, uh, become a bigger problem for us when we're trying to actually work together. And having someone who can sit there and, and moderate and and even times you know stand back and, and maybe in a, in a separate meeting, right? Sort of um, work through one on one issues with each of the the parties. Um, I think that's going to be really helpful and really useful because uh, it's a challenge all the time, and I see it, um, uh, and I'm sure we all do see it um, every time we go out to to a meeting or a discussion. So, <clears throat> diversity and inclusion, especially in tech, is a problem. I think we all we all know that, um, especially in Silicon Valley, it's a pervasive problem. Um, I think the statistic is 60% of people that work in tech um, are men. Um, and especially in Silicon Valley, there is something called the bro culture, which you might have read about here and there, which um, does ex it, that exists. That is very much real and true. If anyone here watches the sitcom Silicon Valley, it's scary how accurate that Favorite sitcom show. is. Um, I watch it just because it really freaks me out about how it's parody of my entire life. But, um, <laughs> but, but it's a problem, right? It's a problem. Um, it's a problem with a lot of dynamic within it. Um, and so there are multiple issues that come up in the form of, we want diverse teams, we can't find the diverse talent. That's false. Um, we, um, we want diverse teams, but we're not going to sacrifice our meritocracy. That's crazy. Um, and then there, what, what, what are some other ones? There are a million ones, but those are like the two, my two favorites. Um, and so are you sacrificing the meritocracy of your talent pool by making diversity and inclusion a priority? Absolutely not. Not at all. Um, there are many places to seek diverse talent, and I'm talking about intersectional diversity. So if we talk about women, we're talking about women of all intersections, of all ethnicities, races, uh, races, religions, sexual orientations, et cetera, et cetera. Immigration status, that always gets left out, but that's a big one. Um, and then if we're talking about general diversity and inclusion, you know, we're including men as well in that, of all intersections. Um, but women tend to be left out of that a lot. Um, so there's, there's, there's that. It's, it's an issue. Um, within blockchain, it's no different. I think that the, the blockchain space is just a reflection of everything that's been going on in tech for um, many, many years. And 
I think what a lot of people don't realize is the Me Too movement actually got its, um, its big push, its big start from tech. Um, and so a lot of people, I think entertainment and Hollywood has really taken over that narrative of the Me Too movement um, with Weinstein and Ashley Judd that started the hashtag. But her, that hashtag became popular because of something an engine, a female engineer wrote, one post that she wrote about her experience at Uber after she left, Susan Fowler. Um, and that post had such high ramifications that Uber did an entire internal overhaul of their leadership and of their management staff, of which their CEO was ousted. So, you know, an experience, an experience, and especially an experience put in writing and published for everyone to see has, has a huge, can have a huge effect. Um, and so the more that we talk about this, the more that we keep it in the dialogue, the more it's on the forefront of our minds and that when we're building our companies and when we're having events and conferences, specifically shout out to a certain conference in Miami that had um, 84 male speakers out of 85 speakers and then had their after party at the strip club. Um, you know, that, that those things don't happen going, going forward. Um, so um, there's one more thing I had to say, but it'll come back to me. So with all that said, um, I would say that, oh, third thing. So the third thing that's been on my mind is how are we structuring that conversation? So I have like this love-hate relationship with women in blockchain panels. This is maybe, this is not the first one I've been on. <laughs> it's, I've been on several of them. Um, and it's an issue that comes up with diversity and inclusion, anything, right? Um, and that is, if you get pinpointed into the woman in blockchain expert or the diversity in tech expert, and someone comes up to you and says, you know, Marquez has spoke a lot about some great things about diversity and inclusion in blockchain, but what does she do? And so all of a sudden you become the, the diversity person and not the entire, the reason why you're in blockchain or some other tech vertical to begin with. And so no one knows that I've spent over a decade or more, or a decade, uh, doing digital health investment or coining an entire ecosystem that's now public health tech. No one would know that. I'm just the woman in blockchain. And so I think it's important that we're including what we do, why we're even here in the first place in the diversity narrative because it can just be tech, or sorry, it could be diversity and inclusion and then everything else. And the two, you know, the point is to integrate the two. Um, and so then, you know, do we have women in blockchain panels like this? Or do we just make sure that all the other panels are representative of women and men and people of color and everything else? So that's the debate. I don't have a great answer. Um, but it's something to think about. Um, again, uh, I, I think that the my experiences have been, um, and, and these are hard conversations to have in a mixed audience. But I'm going to just put it out there, and and that's to say that this industry has ism problems. Every ism you out there, this industry experiences, whether it is sexism, ageism, racism, you name it, we have ism problems inside of tech. And because of that, um, the conversation gets very uncomfortable very quickly when you're trying to address the various issues. I have no problem being a woman in blockchain. I think that we need to have more women in blockchain and more panels and discussions because I come from an innovation background and I know that when women aren't at the innovation table, um, we become more consumers than creators. So I would like to see us have more discussion about um, the isms and have those isms include those true feelings that uh, you might feel. You know, some call it unconscious bias. I call it BS. I say you know what you're feeling when you're dealing with situations and people, et cetera. So confidence is a huge factor in this industry. Um, I think you have to have very tough skin to, to endure and sustain all the cycles that this industry go through. Right now we're moving from a software to a data cycle and that's gonna create a whole new set of jobs and responsibilities, et cetera. 
Um, and so I think that there's a composition of a person that, that um, has to be defined in order to say, um, well, I, I hate to use the word diversity and inclusion because it's been overrated and, and, and underexplained, but I think there has to be some parity, some gender parity that, that uh, is created inside of this new economy that we're going to see inside of this, this whole data world. Um, and and th does that include women? For sure. Does that include uh, teams that are composed of all the various components of which we exist? Absolutely. Um, and so we've got to get past this, um, all these isms. We've got to put them on the table and we've got to say uh, they're no longer invited into our space. And, and until we do that, we're going to have the same problems, same conversations over and over and over again. We're going to have the same feelings in terms of the inclusion and exclusion, et cetera. Um, we have got to talk about the hard things. Thank you, Carol. Mm -hmm. I will keep this short. Um, just say that we as women have a large support network on the inside. So as soon as you become a part of the blockchain a community, there's all these social uh, a media a, 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 a groups out there. And in fact, um, I posted to one of them just yesterday. Um, and I said that I'm on a panel about healthcare and, and blockchain. I'm not a healthcare person. Uh, can someone send me resources or something? Within an hour, I got tons of responses. And actually, uh, just to show you how small this this world is, um, someone actually suggested to reach out to 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 Mar Kessa, um, and it's just uh, uh, once you're on the inside, there are tons of support. On the outside, we could use some more mentorship and education to, to bring in people. So I would like to see some more educational programs and mentorship opportunities for women. And honestly, for anyone, um, that is something that is, that is missing in our community. I want to add just something to that. So Rika brought up a good point. So the, the group she's talking about is called Team Block Society. It's a women in blockchain group started by Yasmin Drummond, um, um, who's a good friend of mine also in the Bay Area. So what Yasmin did is she created Team Block Society just for women. And then alongside it, she created, the, what's it called, co, co, the co-ed. Yeah. Team Block Society. And the reason why she did that is because she understands that movements don't exist or are not as powerful without allies who are outside that group. Right? So if you're talking about if you're talking about a movement that a, a women women's inclusion movement, it's more it's even more powerful with male allies. If you're talking about an ethnic inclusion group, it's even more powerful with someone who that's outside the ethnicity that might be in a position of power, right? Um, so I think that, you know, it's really important, like, you know, for, I see a bunch of men in the room, which is great, but, you know, supporting women, um, and there are different ways to do that uh, in various contexts, um, which we may or may not have time to go into, but something as simple as in conversation around, in a round table, right, saying like, um, you know, it, uh, you know, Rika made a good point about blah, 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 and incorporating that into the conversation because women tend to be overlooked, ignored, or talked over, or talked down to in, con in con group conversations like that. Um, so just like little, little things that allies can do, I think the, the ally point is, a, is something important to bring up. Yeah, I just want to add to that. I, I completely would agree with you on that point. And, um, and, and I want to also build on uh, Marilyn's point around the isms. Uh, we all have internal biases, right? And so when you're in that meeting with one woman and 15 other men, right? Um, there are all sorts of biases when you walk into the room and you see that woman there. And um, so I may have started off as an engineer, as an engineer, but I'm in sales now. And so when I walk into a room, I bet you <laughs> most people don't expect me to be selling something to them. 
And, and so there's that internal bias. Um, and I don't know exactly what goes on, but I know something goes on because I see something shut down. And I've seen this not just once, but more, you know, obviously it's a pattern because I, I like data and I, <laughs> I take that data into, into my memory and I, and I see these patterns. Um, but when, and this is not just for men, um, it's for women too, but anytime we see someone that doesn't fit a stereotype um, or falls into an ism you know, that we haven't talked about, right, um, let's, let's just recognize we have that internal bias, um, recognize that others have that internal bias too, the others that are in that same discussion with us, and then sit back, think about what's the best way to deal with this bias and help um, move the discussion forward around that bias, right? And then, you know, take the time to take that person aside who has the bias and talk to the person about it. Why do you have that bias? In a safe environment, um, can we do other things so that you don't have that bias or address that bias or, or what is it, you know, that we can do to make things better? Because we clearly can work better as a team and we clearly can do so much more and we have, right, uh, when we work together. So, uh, yeah, so that's just one thing I, I, I think we should all do is just recognize that internal bias and then do things, um, help each other, and, and, uh, and uh, you know, speak up about that bias. If I can add an economic perspective to unconscious bias and bias and diversity, unconscious bias <laughs> is really expensive if you're a business. It is really friggin' expensive. So expensive to the point where Starbucks, a global entity, has shut down or shut down for a day in order to do unconscious bias training for all their employees because it is that expensive. When things like Philadelphia happened, the incident where two young black men were arrested in a Philadelphia Starbucks for literally sitting down, quite literally just sitting down, um, that has a lot of economic implications on that business. Not only just on sort of like the uh, pain points within society, just like the microaggressions on society, but it also has a lot of business implications. Um, and so to quote some more statistics, Deloitte did a study, you might remember the year, I can't remember, um, on uh, diverse teams, in, of which they found that diverse teams are more productive on a product level and on a revenue level by 35% compared to non-diverse teams. So this is not just something that's good for society, this is now a business incentive. This is a business priority. Um, and so everyone here is either working for a business or starting one themselves. And so it's really important to be thinking about these things because it's going to affect your product development and it's going to affect your revenue. Thank you. And I, I just would like to follow on of both of those comments and that um, reinforcing the notion that all, all human beings are subject to bias and all human beings internalize bias. And that you know, working to become metacognitive, like you described, where you're actually noticing and thinking about uh, your impulses and reactions, it's, it's one key tactic that all of us can take personally. Um, doing a better job articulating the value proposition for, for, for diversity and inclusion in, in financial and, and capitalist terms would certainly, uh, would certainly benefit us. Uh, this, is, this is an extraordinarily complex and intricate topic, and we're out of time. <laughs> so there, there's so much to talk about, and uh, I know that uh, really wanted to engage the audience with questions, and maybe we can do that in another forum or at another time or at the networking event this evening. We can all throw down about gender issues. That'll be fun. <laughs> uh, thank you for coming. Uh, we really appreciate it, and what a great panel. Thank you very much.